welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And I'm Kevin the Dad. And we have a rather unique tribute episode this week. Yeah. Because we're talking about Dionne Warwick's all-time greatest hits, but we're not just going to be talking about her. We're going to be talking about Burt Bacharach. So, Dad, what do we need to know? Well, we need to know that, like you said, we're going to be doing something different. Uh, Dionne Warwick's hit collection has 24 songs, so obviously this is going to be a two-parter. Mm-hmm. And this time around, we're going to do two biographies. This episode will be about Burt Bacharach, and the next episode will be about Dion herself. Now, as for Burt, Burt Freeman Bacharach was born on May 12, 1928 in Kansas City, Missouri, but grew up in Forest Hills, New York. His mother, Irma, made Burt take piano lessons during his childhood. As a teen, he got into... He got into jazz, but would use a fake ID to get in the clubs to see musicians like Count Basie and Dizzy Gillespie. <laughs> he got a Bachelor of Music from McGill University in Montreal and went on to study at the Mann's School of Music in New York and the Music Academy of the West in Montecito, California. Mm-hmm. In 1950, Bert was drafted into the U.S. Army and served two years. He was stationed in Germany and played piano in officers' clubs there, as well as at Fort Dix and Governor's Island. He met singer Vic Damone whilst in the Army, and when they got out, Bert spent three years as Damone's pianist and conductor. He also provided these services to Steve Lawrence, Polly Bergen, and Paula Stewart, whom he married in 1953. They were divorced in 1958. Ooh. In 1956, Bert got his big break when composer Peter Matz recommended him to Marlena Dietrich. She was looking for an arranger and conductor for her nightclub show. They toured the world on and off until the early 60s. After about five years, Bacharach left to devote himself to songwriting full-time. Dietrich was close to devastated because she had come to rely on him in order to perform to the point where it was like, tell me what to do and I will do it. Oh. Yeah. In 1957, Burt Bacharach met lyricist Hal David while at New York's Brill Building. They got a number one hit on the country chart with The Story of My Life, recorded by Marty Robbins. They followed up with the dopey magic moments there's, there's no other word for it oh. recorded by perry como it hit number four in the u.s and number one in the uk so so much for taste oh. bert, bert also wrote some songs with bob hilliard their huge hit was any day now recorded by chuck jackson elvis and ronnie Millsap, whose 1982 version is the most well known in 1963 bert and hal david made their partnership official but first in 1961 Bert discovered a session singer, one Dion Warwick. The two of them, along with Dion's sister Dee Dee, released a single, Move, Move It on the Backbeat, under the name of Bert and the Backbeats. In 1962, Dion would have her first hit, Don't Make Me Over, and as the French might say, Après Don't Make Me Over, Le Deluge. <laughs> 38 singles released, with 22 making the top 40. And there was a partnership amongst all three, with Dion giving her opinions and suggestions to Bert and Hal. Meanwhile, Bert and Hal were busy cranking out hits for others. What the world needs now for Jackie DeShannon, What's New Pussycat, Whoa, 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 Whoa. Whoa. Sorry, can't help it. For Tom Jones, The Look of Love from the god-awful movie craptacular Casino Royale for Dusty Springfield and Sergio Mendes in Brazil 66, whose version went to number four, while Dusty's stopped at number 22. Interesting. Well, the thing with Casino Royale was um, it's about all these different guys named James Bond. Yep. So they decided to hire Sean Connery, see if he wanted to do it. He said, yeah, give me a million bucks. (laughs) They said no, which I guess in 1966, that was a lot of money. Yeah, like Marlon Brando with Superman. Yeah, exactly. For it was, what, eight minutes of work? Yeah. Yeah. The theme the Casino Royale was also a hit for Herb Albert in the Tijuana Brass. And it's probably that and The Look of Love are probably the best things about that movie because your mom and I only made it to about 10 or 15 minutes and said the hell with it. Yep. Okay. Also, Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid for B.J. Thomas. And Bert and Hal won an Oscar for that song. They're unstoppable. And they then... just crank them out. And then... It all went wrong. <laughs> with Lost Horizon. What's, Someone what's somewhere thought... Hey, let's make a musical movie version of the movie Lost Horizon, which came out in the 30s, which was based on the book Lost Horizon by James Hilton, who also wrote Goodbye, Mr. Chips. 
They made a musical out of Mr. Chips. So let's do one of Lost Horizon. What could possibly go wrong? Everything. And let's get Peter Finch, Liv Ullman, and Olivia Hussey, among others, to sing the songs. And she doesn't sing. But they can't sing. Yeah. So let's dub them. Now, mm. Bert said Lost Horizon almost ended his musical career. Oof. He, he thought the producers were sanctioning weak versions of his and Hal's songs, and he also felt he wasn't getting any support from Hal about this, and thus ended their relationship and their partnership, Oof. whatever you want to call it. Dion Warwick found out about the split like everyone else by reading about it in the newspapers. God damn it! What is it with composers breaking to their leading ladies that, oh, by the way, um, we're calling it quits in the newspaper. It happened to Patti LuPone. It happened to somebody else who I forget right now, but what the hell? I guess it's a tradition. <sighs> the unfortunate one. Now, your friends at Musicals with Cheese, I am begging you to please do an episode about this movie musical. I mean, it split one of the greatest songwriting teams ever. So, it's just begging to be poked and pecked and awarded some sort of stinky cheese. You were saying Limburger, right? Possibly. Or maybe, well... They've also assigned cheese that's been rotted and molded in the garbage for a while, so... There's also Could head be. cheese. Oh, yeah. Heard yeah. of that. But anyways, I've seen that. That looks... Oh, my God. Jess and Andrew, the gauntlet's been thrown. Yeah, Will you yes. accept it? Anyway, the soundtrack actually did better than the movie. And The Fifth Dimension even got a hit with their version of Living Together, Growing Together. Not exactly one of Burton Howe's most memorable songs. It's a little labored. Mm. Now, Burt manages to get through the 70s at one point, even reuniting with Hal David to write and produce an album for Stephanie Mills, the original Dorothy in The Wiz. Oh, yeah. But not for Dion, guys? Come on. Sorry, Dion. Also in the 70s, the Carpenters got a hit with Close to You, originally recorded by Richard Chamberlain back in 1963. The, the, yes. The, the, best, the basketball guy? Or am I thinking of no, you're one? thinking of Will Chamberlain. Sorry! Richard Chamberlain. He was in that version of The Three Musketeers, the Richard Lester one with Oliver Reed and Michael York. Oh, the one that we watched with Raquel Welch. Yeah, okay. he was um, he was Aramis. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. Good, good yep. piece. Got it. And Close to You, I Couldn't Let This Go By, also makes an appearance in Dave Barry's Book of Bad Songs, and I quote, You have to ask yourself, do I really want to be near someone who causes birds to appear suddenly? Didn't Alfred Hitchcock do a horror movie about this? <laughs> now, in 1980, Burt divorced Angie Dickinson, whom he'd married in 1965. But then he starts a new partnership with lyricist Carol Bayer Sager, and now all of a sudden it's marriage number three for Burt. They married in 1982 and divorced in 1991. Burt's fourth and final wife was Jane Hansen, whom he married in 1993. And so until his death in... Uh, Last month. Yeah, okay. Yep. Anyway, Burton and Cal write Arthur's theme along with Christopher Cross and Peter Allen, and all four of them won an Oscar for Best Song. That's right, you people of a certain age. Christopher Cross has an Oscar. Go figure. <laughs> Burt himself would wind up a Tony Short of an EGOT. Ooh. And I believe at one time there was some sort of Broadway review of like all their songs, and it was like, Back in the late seventies, early eighties. You mean of of Hell David and Burt Backrack stuff? Yeah, yeah. Huh. Okay. But you know what? Someone out there needs to do one of those musicals based on all his songs, so he can win a Tony if it's good. I mean, they already wrote "Promises, Promises." They could do a revival of that. That's true. Yeah. And the hits keep coming. They write "Heart Light" with Neil Diamond. Yes, which is that goopy ET song, which also makes an appearance in Dave Barry's book. And they also wrote On My Own for Patti LaBelle and Michael McDonald. But biggest of all was 1985's That's What Friends Are For. Originally written in 1982, it was first recorded by your pal... No. Rod Stewart. Oh. For the movie Night Shift. I thought you were going to say Elvis Costello. I was like, oh, God. And Night Shift, hilarious movie. Michael Keaton, Henry Winkler, Shelley Long. And it has that deathless quote. Wait a minute. Why don't they just mix the mayonnaise with the tuna in the can? Hold the phone. Why don't they just feed the tuna mayonnaise? Call Starkist. That's what that's from? Yes. I gotta see this movie it's now. It's hysterical. 
Anyway, three years later, it would be recorded by a collaboration called Dion and Friends. It consisted of Dion Warwick, Gladys Knight, Elton John, and Stevie Wonder. Holy shit. It raised $3 million for the American Foundation for AIDS Research, a.k.a. AMFAR. Oh, yeah. And it hit number one and stayed there for four weeks. In the 90s, Burt Bacharach continued playing concerts, occasionally joined Dion Warwick for sold-out concerts, and made a cameo in 1997's Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery. He also cameoed in the two sequels. In 1998, he teamed up with your pal and his, Elvis Costello, Mm -hmm. for the album Painted From Memory. In the 2000s, he's still touring and he's still making albums. And in 2016, he composed music for the movie A Boy Called Poe, based on a true story about a boy with autism. He worked on the movie as a tribute to his daughter, Nikki, who had gone undiagnosed with Asperger's and committed suicide when she was 40. Oh, jeez. In 2012, he and Hal David both received the Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song. It was the first and so far only time the honor had been given to a songwriting team. And Hal David had also died in 2012 at the age of 91. So he was, I believe he was eight years older than Bert. Okay. In 2018, he wrote and released Live to See Another Day with proceeds going to the Sandy Hook Promise Charity. Oh, yeah. In 2020, he and multi-instrumentalist excuse me, Daniel Tashian released an album called Blue Umbrella, which was nominated for a Grammy. And just as an aside, Daniel's father was Barry Tashian from Boston's Barry and the Marine Remains, who opened for the Beatles on their final U.S. tour. Wow. And Jules, Mm -hmm. like it or not, next month we'll see the release of The Songs of Backrack and Costello. Basically every damn thing they wrote and performed together. Oh, no. Burt Backrack died on February 8th of natural causes. He was 94 years old. Mm -hmm. As for me and Burt, well, I've always felt this about him. Uh Uh-oh. He could write him with Hal, but he sure couldn't sing him. Oh, yeah, you were telling me. Yeah, his voice is... To be endured, if possible. Wow. Ouch. And all I can say is thank God Bert discovered Dionne Warwick. As I once told your mom, her voice is like a subtle perfume. At first you don't notice it, but then you're captivated. Mm, interesting. Okay. And yeah, it just came out. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'm the only person who feels that way. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Back in the 80s, Rhino put out a two-record anthology on vinyl. And in 1989, they put out the Dionne Warwick Collection on CD. 24 songs, 22 of them written by Burt Bacharach and Hal David. And don't worry, we'll highlight the interlopers when we get to them. Oh yeah, one of them's on here. Yep. (laughs) And I gotta say, for a CD that came out in 1989, it sounds great. It does, it sounds really good. It does. Shall we start? Yes. All right, first track, Don't Make Me Over. Don't Make Me Get Up. You come over there. Chris, no, good God, she can sing. I think the phrase make me over might have meant something different in the 60s because when I hear that, I think make over. Then again, it might mean the same thing as it does now. She's just trying to say, don't change me. Love me for all I am and hold me tight because I love you so much. Anyone who heard this woman sing and wasn't moved by her would have to be made of a heart of stone. As for the music, the drums convey power while the strings convey sweetness, providing a perfect balance of down-to-earth passion and dreamy romance. Yep, this was Dionne Warwick's first single. Originally, it was going to be Make It Easy on Yourself, a song she had demoed, but it was given to Jerry Butler instead, and Dion was not happy about that. Uh Uh-oh. She let Bert and Hal have it. I let them know that one thing they cannot do is change me. Don't make me over. Mm -hmm. Thus inspired, they wrote this song, and it became her first hit. Background vocals were provided by Dee Dee Warwick, Sylvia Shemwell, and Sissy Houston, Dion Dion and Dee Dee's aunt and Whitney's mother. Lyrically, I think it works on two levels. First, it seems it's the part of a relationship where the sunshine and lollipops and rainbows phase is over, and the everydayness of it has begun. Mm -hmm. Boyfriend's getting critical, and Dion tells him, just love me with my faults the way I love you. Ooh. Ouch. Nailed it. (laughs) She also tells him, always be by my side if I am wrong or right. And second level, it's Dion standing up for herself, not only as a singer, as a person, Accept me for what I am. Accept me for the things that I do. And this being the early 60s, I'm sure the civil rights implications of those lines did not go unnoticed. Mm. 
And it's a good beginning for Bert, Hal, and Dion. They would get better. Next track, This Empty Place. Ooh, those background singers are so lovely on the ears. I love the musical arrangements and orchestrations more here. There's a greater sense of drama with the piano, drums, and horns. It sounds almost like battle music with how serious it is. And the arrangement they wrote for Dion here has her do some interesting changes in her vocal register that are fascinating to listen to, especially with her low notes in this. The empty place is where her love used to stand as they walked down the street, and this place is now filled with sadness and tears. I'm more for breakup songs that are less boo-hoo and more F-U, but this one is so musically interesting that you get hooked. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Dion's walking down the street minding her own business, and she <laughs> looks, and she's like, oh, yeah. You're not here. Empty place. Mm -hmm. And knowing his embrace can fill this empty place. Mm -hmm. And Dion, oh my God, she's doing some major begging right mm -hmm. down to the, if you don't come back to me, I'll die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found the, the ending of this song really interesting musically because it shifts from slow to fast tempos and it works. It just really grabs your attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next track, Anyone Who Had a Heart. That excludes you, Tin Man. It's not his fault. The saxophone solo is the best part of this whole mm. song, hinting at the dark underbelly of anger and pain. This woman is wasting her time on the wrong man. She loves him, and anyone with a heart can see it. Oh, and also anyone who had a heart, unlike this scumbag over here, would love her back. You could tell how Dion, by how Dion sings this, though, that she doesn't want anyone else, and she's making these arguments to hope that they're strong enough to force this guy to love her the way she deserves, which, oof, says a lot about her and what the character thinks of herself. God, I hope she finds someone better. Less doormat, more kick-ass. Uh -huh. Um... When I, I've heard this song like a billion times, but it always seems when I listen to these songs for podcasts, I notice things I've never noticed before. Mm -hmm. And to me, anyone who had a heart kind of sort of sounds like Don't Make Me Over musically. And I think maybe Bert and Hal wanted a do-over. We can make this better. And they <laughs> did. Um, the song had time changes of 4-4, four, 5-4, four, four, and at the end, 7-8. Whoa. And Bert Baccarat said this wasn't intentional. It just felt right. Oh, okay. And his thing was like he always went for the feel, you know, time signatures be damned. Cool. Hal David said he struggled with the line, and no, I dream of you, because the stress is on the word of, not dream, oh. or you. And it just drove him nuts, but eventually he realized he had to let it go. Mm. Lyrically, a straightforward message. You know, anyone who had a heart would love me. What's your problem? Oh, I guess you don't have a heart. Is that it? <laughs> That's it. Thankfully, Hal David wrote lots better than that. But that is the not-so-underlying message of the song. Mm. And there are so many cover versions out there. But Dion's is definitive, which I'm going to end up saying that a lot through this in the next episode. Gotcha. And this was her first million seller, a classic. And I... Like you, I love that sax solo. It's so haunting and it just nails like the despair and the loneliness. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I hope she did better. Mm. Next track, Walk On By. I can hear Carol King singing this. I guess I could. Yeah. If you listen to the song, you can tell her and Bert were contemporaries. Well, I mean, there's that whole Brill, brill building thing going yeah. on where they you know, wrote songs in the same mm -hmm. office. Yep. Yep. Listening to this song, I began to understand why Burt Bacharach became more famous than Hal David because Bacharach's musical choices are so interesting to listen to. The moment he chooses to have a trumpet play and that little bridge with the background singer is as powerful and heavenly as they sing these minor chords ever so softly with an echo. It's the music that makes the story of the song come alive. And you hear how bad Dion wants this guy to walk on by, partly not to, to have him, you know, not see her crying, and because she wants to avoid him as much as possible and not have the pain resurface. From a music standpoint, this song is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, once again, I noticed, okay, this sounds like this empty place, but slowed down. Hmm. And again, it seems like Bert and Hal thought, we can do this better, much, much better. To the point where it's another classic because there are so many covers out there. The most unusual is Isaac Hayes' 12-minute version from his Hot Buttered Soul album. Whoa. Oh, yeah. He whittled it down to four and a half minutes for a single. And it's great. He, at one point, says, you know, you, you really socked it to me. You, you could, <laughs> I, I should have sent it to you. You, you, should, you should look it up when you get a chance. I mean, I've got the four and a half minute version, not the 12-minute. And 
um, Dion's version is just untouchable. And again, lyrically straightforward, Dion tells her ex if he sees her walking down the street and she starts to cry when they meet, just walk on by, mm. baby, because all she has left is her foolish pride. Next track, you'll never get to heaven if you break my heart. So there. Oh yes, bossa nova, here we go. Very Astrid Gilberto and I'm here for it. Dion gives a warning. If you break my heart, you'll never get to heaven. But as soon as I heard the music, I realized, is this the kind of music Barry Manilow was trying to sound like? I don't know. Because I can hear this music's influence on Copacabana. And I love the woodwind instruments here. And there's a key change here I actually like that doesn't ruin the song. Normally key changes are lame, but this actually goes to a key I like. And while this message might be scary for Dion's man if he doesn't get his act together, she sounds like an angel with her voice that floats on the air with the la-la-las. Such a pretty song that sounds like it is being sung by an angel. Mm -hmm. Maybe Barry was influenced because he was responsible for uh, Dion's uh, comeback oh. um, in the early 80s, produced uh, produced her some of her albums. I don't know if he wrote any of this song. It's possible. Mm. Uh, anyway, I'll be. It's the third classic in a row. <laughs> Son of a gun. Um, and again, this is a song with so many covers out there. The best being the Stylistics version in 1973. And their version charted higher than Dion's. Blasphemy? Mm. No. Because they did a great job, thanks to Russell Tompkins Jr.'s high tenor vocal, which... You've got to hear. I mean, I know your mom has that love songs of Brett Bacharach, yeah. which is kind of like Dionne Warwick's greatest hits, but covered by other people. <laughs> and lyrically, it's just so innocent. Like the like the the sentiment is basically be nice to me, or you'll make the angels cry, and then you won't get into heaven after you're dead. Mm. But you know what? Dion puts this over, and you would never want to break her heart. Damnation or not. Mm -hmm. I love everything about this song. I love how the la la la's at the open and close are like bookends to the song. Mm -hmm. And I love the chimes, the gentleness of the instruments being played, and of course Dion's voice. She has complete mastery over the material. And just listening to her sing the la la la's is heaven. I could mm -hmm. just listen to her sing that through the whole song and mm -hmm. I'd be perfectly fine with it. Mm -hmm. Next track, a house is not a home. A chair is a chair and a room is a room. But a house is not a home when lovers are apart. Holy shit, this song is so sad. It really got to me. Maybe because I plan on moving out soon and I don't want to be lonely even though I'll have a roommate. Your heart just breaks for her with the sorrow in her voice emanating from the speakers, yearning for him to be there. Now I understood what Brene Brown meant when she said, people listen to sad songs more because sometimes the feelings of love are stronger in them. The love she has for this man just washes over you. You can't help but be moved. As for Luther Vandross, how in the heck did he make this song seven minutes? It does go on a bit too long, but anyone would be a fool to hear that voice and not be moved to getting on your knees. Like, oh my God, someone find these people's partners and push them back into those houses. Mm -hmm. Maybe they go kicking and screaming. I don't care. And the, the fourth classic in a row. Mm -hmm. And it was written for the movie of the same name, which I've never heard of. But, uh, but Brooke Benton's version appears in the film. Dion's version was the B-side to You'll Never Get to Heaven. Both versions had modest, modest success but it went on to be covered by a lot of artists, such as Luther Vandross, who, like you said, recorded a seven-minute version for his debut album, Never Too Much. It went on to become one of his signature songs. When he performed it at the 1988 NAACP Awards, he brought Dionne Warwick to tears. And you know why? Mm. Why? Because I think he did it better than she did. Oh, no. And her version is pretty awesome. And, you know, Luther's is seven minutes but to me, it's not one minute nor one second is wasted. And I gotta admit, he, he, he had me a little verklempt, a Aww. little choked up there. Aww. And I cannot remember the last time that happened to me while listening to a song. That says something. It does. And this is just one of the saddest songs ever. And it's almost yeah. like the divorce song. Oh. He's gone and she's got the house, but I'm not li meant to live alone. Turn this house into a home. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me. Odds are, you kind of hope he'd come back for her. Kind of hope it. But probably not. Probably not, because then it would be a happy ending song. Next track, Reach Out For Me, 
a very comforting song of reassurance. It's very tender and quiet with the music, except for those intense kettle drums that convey how strong and true this love is. Dion sings about how when people turn on you and life gets too tough, you can reach out to her and she'll take care of you. I always love it in songs when partners promise to take care of the ones they love because really, the two of you are taking care of each other as well as yourselves. It's simple and true and powerful, and she sounds so sweet saying it, like we caught them in an intimate moment at the end of a long day where her arms are waiting. This was originally written in 1963 and first recorded by Lou Johnson. Uh, his version made it to number 74, and Dion's 1964 version made it to number 20. Life got you down, people make you feel small, small. Friends Not True, Reach Out for Dion, for TLC. And I think this is an okay song. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. I've never skipped over it. But if you want a, a better song, would Reach Out for Me in title? Mm -hmm. We're talking the four tops. Reach Out for Me. I'll be there. Oh. Awesome stuff. Mm. Next track. Who Can I Turn To When Nobody Needs Me? Ah, yes. Anthony Newley and Leslie Bacuse's song from Stop the World, I Want to Get Off. Excuse me. Did you say Anthony? Yes. That's how he says it. Not the Anthony? No, it's Anthony because he's the English. The H is silent? Yeah. Is that how they do it out there? Yeah. So, um, Anthony Hopkins? Yeah. Anthony Hopkins. Okay. All right, anyway, the version I heard prior to this is Barbara Streisand's duet with Anthony, which I enjoyed. And I like Anthony Newley's voice more than most people because it's a unique sound, and I happen to find it fascinating, and I like it because you don't hear it every day. Another song about loneliness that speaks truth. Who do you turn to when your one confidant turns away? And we're not talking about a therapist here. We're talking about that spouse, that best friend who has been with you through all the shit life throws. And when that person goes, who's left? It's a sobering and heartbreaking thought, and it's a moment we all will face. And Anthony Newley and Leslie Bacuse write about the despair of that moment so beautifully. Honestly, to me, it doesn't matter who's performing this song because it's so damn good. Okay, oh, uh -oh. I think we're going to disagree on this. This was obviously not written by Bert and Hal. No. It was written by Leslie Bacus. Bacus. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Anthony Newley. Sorry. It's okay. From the musical The Roar of the Grease Paint, The Smell of the Crowd. Now, Tony Bennett did a version of this that went to number 33. Yes. And he re-recorded it in 2011 as a duet with Queen Latifah and again in 2012 with Gloria Estefan. Ooh. And it became a concert staple of his. Cool. And... It's been recorded a lot of other times beyond Tony's version. Obviously, Dion did a version. Hers made it to number 62. And to me, it has a Broadway musical feel about it for about the mm -hmm. first two lines. Then that bass comes in and turns it into like, I guess, like a standard pop song or just a I pop guess. song. Then for the last couplet at the end of the song, we're back in Broadway territory. Again, I find this to be an okay song. And you did send me the Barbara Anthony Newley duet. Anthony Newley duet yeah. Which... I didn't care for, to put it politely, Why? because I'm not crazy about this. Hey, one of us is dead, but that's <laughs> not going to stop me from singing with them. I, I'm, I'm just not too crazy about that. And I think we can all look at Natalie Cole and say, thanks for nothing. Um, <laughs> I'm just, and his voice is just, yes, I, I will give it to you. It's very unique. Yep. And you know it's him you within know it's him. Yep. like four notes at the most. Yep. And maybe tomorrow, you know. Oh, that vibrato <laughs> just like uh, goes through me like I don't know what. Like a knife. Or a hot oil enema. <laughs> anyway. Oh my god. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I listened to it and I just wasn't crazy about it, and Barbara was kind of turning me off. And um, the one thing I will give Anthony Newley credit for, he was married to Joan Collins. Which so, you still can't believe. He must have had something going for him. And for that, sir, I salute you. Next track. Looking with my eyes. As opposed to with my nose. This song is a bit more up-tempo for a refreshing change with some fun piano playing in the background. I would add a caveat to this song. She's singing about how looking with her eyes, things look bad. But closing her eyes and looking with her heart, things are going to be fine with the man she loves. My caveat here is look with your brain and then your heart. Most of the time when media romanticizes love, they say, look with your heart or ignore your brain. Listen to your heart. The heart never lies. In real life, you gotta look with both. The heart's in denial. It's just in denial. So while the, while the song is fun, just just be careful. Don't, don't, don't take it as life advice. Um, I really don't think much of this song. Okay. In that, like, 
it's an okay song, but to me, it's just not very memorable. I mean, I cannot even call up the, the melody or anything about it. And I'm getting worried now because for me, that's three okay songs in a row. Will there be a fourth? With, Let's find out. Are you there with another girl? Ooh, boy, this is anxiety to a T. There are so many TikToks on the internet about girlfriends worrying that their guy is with some other woman. Then it cuts to the guy playing Star Wars with the boys. <laughs> Sometimes people can't help it. You know, anxiety sucks and our brain makes up stories to protect us against the worst possible outcome. But then Dion notices that there's two silhouettes by the windowsill in addition to hearing music from the radio and her man's laughter, which those three things together without context, it's pretty, pretty suspicious. She's willing to believe the best in him for now, and that final stanza of you would never leave me, hurt me, or deceive me builds and builds with intensity as the drums strike harder. Dion increases the passion in her singing, and the volume crescendos as her worries explode. A bit too relatable. And we're back on track. Dion has her suspicions. The music coming from his radio, mm -hmm. his laughter. And I kind of looked at it differently because I'm thinking, well, you know, he never played that music for her on oh, his radio. Oh, okay. And he never laughed like that in front of her before. Why is he playing different music? And why is he laughing a little too happily? And why are there two silhouettes by the windowsill instead of one? Because he's not making like the bunny with his hand or something. No, no, no. no this is another no. person. This is that's person. that's another silhouette and a half right there. Yep. And that the silhouettes on the shade, that's the clincher, though. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, it's not a classic, but it's... Better than okay. So it's somewhere for me, it's between classic and okay status. Okay. So I guess that would be grade-wise, B+. Plus. Next track, Message to Michael. Is this song autobiographical? Was Michael based on a real singer? I have a million questions. And I have a million answers. Okay. Dion is in love with a famous singer whose real name is Michael and has been away for about a year. All she knows is he's in New Orleans and, yeah, well, he's been away for about a year. That's it. This is the other perspective of the airport, give it the airport, take it the way. Mm. Or this could also be uh, the girl who loved him pre-fame and still loves him post-fame. I hope that Bluebird finds Michael and conveys the message because she really conveys the yearning that comes when you don't know what's happened to someone you love while they're so far away. Uh, this was first known as a message to Martha. Who's Martha? I don't know. It was recorded by Lou Johnson in 1964, but Burt Bacharach retitled it Kentucky Bluebird. It did not chart. Marlene Dietrich recorded the German version in 1964 called, roughly translated, Faithful Little Nightingale. Aww. You will find Michael and you will shoot him down. And then we will invade Poland. Oh, God. As for Dionne Warwick, she first recommended the song to French singer Sasha Distel. Distel. Anyway, with whom she was headlining at the Paris Olympia Theater in 1966. Composer-arranger Jacques Dijon prepped a track, but Destel changed his mind. Dion decided to record it over the objections of Burton Hal. They thought it was a guy song. Hal David said the only M name he could think of was Michael, and he hated that name. <laughs> so, of course, Dion used that name. Ah, good for you, lady. Scepter Records issued it as a single because one of the reps at Scepter, Steve Terrell, loved it. He got on a plane to New Orleans and went to station WQNO and played it for a disc jockey who put it, who took it and put it on the radio. And since the lot, the first line in the song is "Fly Away to New Orleans," it became a massive hit within a week. It also became Dion's first top twenty hit since "Reach Out for Me" from 1964. And better, it hit the top ten, going to number eight. Mm -hmm. And Burton Hal ate some crow. <laughs> oh yeah. And for me, Martha, I think, well, is there another name out there? A message to, I, I couldn't think of any other. For guys or for women? For women. A message to Maria? A message Mildred. to Marie? A message to Marie? <laughs> message to Hortense? Melissa? Message to Melissa. Message to Missy. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Mavis. As for the story song, Dion wants a Kentucky bluebird to fly to New Orleans with a message to Michael. Why Kentucky specifically? I don't know. Hmm. Maybe that's where the bluebirds are. Uh, okay. Maybe they're plentiful there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If there's any ornithologists out there, please let us know. Yeah. Uh, so he moved there to make it big, but changed his name too, which probably made it hard for the bluebird to find Michael. Yeah, like, oh, great, thanks a lot. Now yeah. I got no idea who this guy is. But I digress. 
in those lines. Oh, tell him how my heart just breaks in two since he journeyed far. And even though his dream of fame fell through, to me, he will always be a star. Mm. I love this song. It has a gentle sway to it thanks to the percussion and bass. And Dion's vocal is perfect, such longing and yearning. It's a classic. And for the first time, I noticed how much this song sounds like the Temptations 1968 song, I Wish It Would Rain. Musically, they just sound so similar. And I bet Bert and Hal could have gotten some royalties. Well, maybe just Bert from writing the music. Mm -hmm. Final track, Trains, Boats, and Planes. Not planes, trains, not trains, planes, and automobiles. Those aren't pillows. Unlike Message to Michael, we don't know why the guy on this song has gone away. According to Dion, everything was going good, but then he left. Maybe it's the story of fell in love while traveling, and now, well, he's got to go back home. But damn it, she's going to wait until he gets back, which that is dedication. And she prays that he'll come back to her. I really hope he does. This song aches more than Message to Michael because of how her voice echoes and how she sounds like she's trying to keep calm and be dignified while her heart is just a mess. Good song for a long-distance relationship or when loved ones go on a trip and leave for the holidays. Mm. And like you said, not to be confused with trains, boats, planes, trains, and automobiles, and I'm pretty sure John Candy and Steve Martin did not record a version of this song. That would have been hilarious. Uh, this was originally intended for Gene Pitney to record. He had some hits with Burton Howe songs, 24 Hours from Tulsa, only Love Can Break a Heart, and The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance from the movie of the same name mm -hmm. with uh, Jimmy Stewart and Jack Palance. Palance, Palance, sorry. Anyway, he told Burt Bacharach, and I quote, I don't think it's one of your better ones. And he, de he declined it. So Burt recorded this himself in 1965. But luckily for us, Dionne Warwick recorded it in 1966. And yes, there are a lot of other cover versions out there. Those trains and boats and planes took Dion's love away from her because originally he's from some other part of the world and he has to go back there a while to do something. TCB, as Elvis would say, you know, take care of business. And the first thing I thought of was Michael Corleone in The Godfather where he has to go to Italy. Oh, yeah. And hey, he gets <gasps> married and starts this other She's life. Diane Keaton. Uh, and that was the first thing I thought of were like, Okay, he's going back to from whence he came and... Uh. Which, side note, when we watched that movie in high school, my friends and I preferred Apollonia to Diane Keaton. We were like, we were like, how dumb is this lady? Like, okay, we're going to go off on a little tangent No, go here. ahead, tangent okay. away. But for those of you who haven't seen the movie, it opens with Michael Corleone. He's uh, going to a wedding of his sister, right? And he's been away fighting in the war, I think. WW2, the big one. Yeah. So he comes back and he's got this girl whose name I forget, but I'll just call her Diane Keaton. K. Yeah, K. And basically, uh, he's, he's kind of worried to be back home. And she's like, well, what's wrong? And he's, he's, she's kind of like, well, you know, uh, he basically. Don't ever ask me what I do, K. Don't ever ask me what I do. And he's like, you know, my, he basically says, Okay, well, my my family has this business, and I kind of don't want to be part of it. And this woman, who's at, keep in mind, a giant Italian wedding. A giant Italian wedding. She deadass looks at this man and goes, what does that mean? I'm like, you moron, what do you think it means? And then he goes to Italy, has to do this business thing. To say I'm not going to over. Yeah, and then there's, there's this family... And I guess he insults somebody or something goes wrong where this woman's virtue is being questioned or something. And so he says, all right, I'll make it up to you. I'll marry this girl. And the dad's like, okay, fine. That settles everything. So then they get married. He's happy. They play this really romantic song in the background. And uh, spoiler alert, one day Apollonia is driving home in the car, do, 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 and the car explodes. So uh, now that marriage is ruined, and he's got to go back to the United States. And Kay, they meet up, like, outside her house or something. It's in public. And then he's like, hey, baby, I'm so sorry. And she's like, I can't take you back. And I'm like, you dumbass, you shouldn't take him back. You straight up got married to another woman. And then he's like, well, I'm sorry. I don't mean it. I'll never do it again. She's like, okay, fine. And then at the end of the movie, movie we all cheered because he finally spoiler alert becomes the godfather and then there's that scene where everybody kisses his hand and the door shuts and she's crying and my friends and i cheered because we we're like yes yes finally finally she realizes it that dumb woman and that's the godfather you're welcome and that's why we had to have a part two to see what was going to happen next oh, man anyway let's get back to this shall we <laughs> okay 
That would be my favorite rant I've ever done on this show. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. Nice. Uh, nice, nice ranting. Thank you. Anyway, okay. interesting arrangement with the electric piano and that tearing guitar sound. At least I think it's a guitar. Yeah. And I think this whole song could have just been carried by those two instruments. Mm -hmm. um, and But then, you know, other instruments come in because it's probably musicians union out there. Like, you know, you got to have at least one drummer and someone mm -hmm. else and they got to get paid. But those two instruments are the most dominant. Mm -hmm. And then the middle eight, it's like the arrangement just goes off somewhere else. But then it comes back because mm -hmm. we've got the rest of the song to do. And really sad lyrics. And Dion ends the song um, with some humming because it's just a catchy song. But it's still sad. Mm -hmm. And it's just another classic. And... You know, so with that message to Michael, we're back on track with classics. We're doing pretty well here. But then again, that's 12 songs, and we've got 12 more to go. Think the trend will last? Oh, we'll find out. Stay tuned. Because the next episode, we'll do Dion's biography mm -hmm. and the remaining 12 songs on this collection. Spoiler alert, in my opinion, almost all of them are classics. So we'll say that overall with part one. Uh, I'm really appreciating Dionne Warwick's performances as a singer and the musical choices Burt Bacharach made with each track. Uh, it's always interesting to hear what instruments were chosen, what dynamics are used when, and how he has a distinct sound. While he has a distinct sound, you can tell each song apart from one another. So I'm intrigued to hear more. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I've just always loved her voice since I was a kid, maybe. Mm hmm and hearing her stuff originally on the radio. Yes, I'm that old. I'm going to tweet um, this episode at her, by the way. We'll see if she bites. I don't know if she will, but her Twitter's hilarious. I love it. Um, and then um, your mom and I, we've had discussions over the years. I love her voice, and your mom is less than impressed. What? But she does love her song, No Night So Long, I believe it is, which was part of her uh, 80s comeback. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Um, it's going to be a while before we do uh, part two because one of us is going to London, and it's not me. Hello. So please hang in there. We'll probably get back... Uh, Mid-March. Mid-March or so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, once I get back, then we'll keep up with the podcast, and we'll give you part two. All right, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz, because remember, the more you interact with the video, the greater of a chance we have of being seen on the homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, he can email the episode you want to hear right to your inbox. As always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We will be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about Dad. Anything you want to say before we sign off? Yes, join us next time when we attempt to answer the biggest question of them all. What? What's it all about? Alfie? Maybe.